everyone and welcome back to my channel. Um, so in this video I wanted to carry on uh, reviewing the immune system book from where I finished off uh, in last week's video. Um, it's just I, I just wanted to sort of share uh, the key insights really from the book um, as I thought it was very interesting. Um, one thing in the book that I found particularly insightful uh, was, was um, a bit on the metabolism of immune cells, how immune cells are um, recycled and rejuvenated. This is done through a biological process called autophagy, which literally means self-eating. Autophagy means the recycling of cell contents in order to maintain cell survival. And it can be triggered by starvation. Autophagy is uh, meant to be, an, in fact, an improved, in improving the lifespan. Now, in the case of lymphocytes, the white blood cells, autophagy is required to maintain long-lived memory. Other than starvation, ways, which obviously isn't recommended, <laughs> at least in the long term, <laughs> ways to encourage um, autophagy um, you, um, can be uh, gained through certain um, dietary, through the diet, um, particularly in a molecule called spermidine. Now, spermidine is found in food, and this can and spermidine can trigger um, autophagy. As I, as I mentioned, starvation also encourages autophagy, not to be encouraged in the long term. But people do sometimes practice something called calorie restriction, which has been shown to encourage autophagy and calorie restriction in a very controlled way, which. Um, uh, can sometimes be practiced, but um, only really, ideally, under the um, in a very careful way. Um, but also, exercise um, can also encourage autophagy. But um, in terms of diet, um, spermidine is is a compound that really does encourage autophagy. And uh, this was at first isolated in semen, hence the name. But uh, spermidine isn't isn't just found in semen. Um, it's, it's found um, in other parts of the body as well. Uh, now, good dietary sources are mature cheese, mushrooms, legumes and whole grains. Spermidine is a polyamine compound. Polyamines are derived from amino acids, which of course are the building blocks of protein. And... They are involved in the growth of cells. Polyamines um, contain various chemicals, including spermidine. So they are um, they form part of the makeup of spermidine. Is one of the chemicals that, that forms part of the makeup of the polyamines, which are themselves derived from amino acids. Another important source, yeah, and as I say, um, so it's a polyamine compound and um, spermidine is, enhances autophagy or the cell's self-eating behaviour, which, which helps the cells rejuvenate, stay young, uh, stay healthy, boosts the immune system, kind of anti-inflammatory effects and um, anti-cancer effects. Uh, so I, I mentioned some of the key foods that are rich in spermidine. Also, uh, garlic is a good source. Broccoli, tomatoes, almonds, bananas, spinach, lentils, chickpeas. Mushrooms come top of the list. Mushrooms are a very good source of spermidine. And also oranges are a particularly good source. Autophagy. It's a good word, that. Autophagy. Literally meaning, as I've said already, but I'll say it again, the consumption of the body's own tissue as a met metabolic process occurring naturally in starvation, which can um, alter, which which can be, which as I say, results in renewal. Okay, back to viruses. So um, I'm going to talk about viruses now. Um, 
I haven't got the book with me, it's in another room, but I've also been reading uh, Viruses. It's the same sort of format as this book, but it's Viruses, a very short introduction, which is also a great series, by the way. And the Viruses one actually has, um, at the back of the book, it actually contains a, um, a dictionary um, of the keywords, which is very helpful. Now, viruses are not cells, but particles. Um, they contain a protein coat, which surrounds and protects the genetic material. The outer coat, the outer protein coat, is called the capsid. And capsids come in various shapes and sizes. And they are built up of protein subunits called capsomeres. And it's the arrangement of these around the central genetic material that determines the shape of the virus. Some viruses have an outer layer surrounding the capsid called an envelope. Inside the viral capsid is its genome, which is either RNA or DNA. Now, viruses are obliged to obtain essential components from other living things to complete their life cycle. They are therefore known as obligate parasites. Cells contain a variety of organelles essential for life, such as the ribosomes that manufacture proteins. But viruses have none of these, so they are literally inert until they infect cells. Now, animal viruses infect cells by binding to specific cell surface receptor molecules. The cell receptor is like a lock, and only viruses that carry the right receptor binding key can open it and enter that particular cell. Receptor molecules differ from one type of virus to another. Once the virus is bound to its cellular receptor, the capsid penetrates the cell and its genome is released into the cell. The genome must download the information it carries inside the cell in order to reproduce, so it can manufacture its own proteins. DNA viruses masquerade as pieces of cellular DNA. Viral DNA is transcribed into RNA messages, which are read and then translated into viral proteins by the cell's, ribos by the cell's ribosomes. RNA viruses are one step ahead because they already have the code as RNA and they, they, they also already carry enzymes that enable the RNA to be copied and translated into proteins so they're not quite so dependent on the cellular enzymes. In mammalian cells, the process of copying DNA during cell division is highly regulated uh, with a proofreading system to detect damage or miscopied DNA. Although mistakes still slip through at times, and uh, these mutations are passed on, um, this does not happen as this does not happen too often. But, vi but viral genomes, by contrast, mutate a lot more quickly. So, uh, um, as viruses reproduce quickly, and RNA viruses have no proofreading systems, so there's a higher mutation rate than the DNA viruses. Viruses infect organisms in all three domains of life, the archaea, bacteria and eukarya. Viruses evolved before these domains separated from the common ancestor, the last universal cellular ancestor known as LUCA. So viruses are, are really, really ancient. There are many different theories as to, where, as to how viruses came into being, but, no, but scientists are at loggerheads with one another and they can't quite decide which theory is correct. The first theory is that viruses were the very first organisms to arise in the primordial soup four billion years ago. It is suggested that the large DNA viruses may represent a previously free-living life form that has now lost its ability to reproduce independently. The second theory is that viruses originated before the advent of DNA when primitive pre leuka cells used RNA. The viruses, it is suggested that viruses derive from escaped fragments of RNA that acquired a protein coat and became infectious. Or the third theory is that the primitive is that primitive RNA cells have been reduced to a parasitic lifestyle through being outcompeted when other more complex cells evolved. That would explain 
RNA viruses. But there's a question mark about DNA viruses. Did the DNA viruses evolve from more ancient RNA counterparts? For example, the retroviruses, including HIV, have the ability to transcribe their RNA into DNA. It's a very clever process. Um, and this reverses for more usual flow of genetic information from DNA to RNA to protein. And this then tricks the cell by forming part of a cell DNA. So, did DNA viruses evolve from more, comp from more ancient RNA counterparts? But we just don't know. Something we do know is that Viruses are everywhere in the virus. It's something called the virosphere. Viruses form a huge biomass in the environment. But the most numerous microbes on Earth. And that's saying something, because microbes are the most abundant life form. And viruses, being microbes, are the most abundant of the most abundant life forms. <laughs> viruses that infect archaea and archaea, Okay, okay, yeah. and bacteria are called bacteriophages, or just simply phages. Virus is also the most abundant life forms in the oceans, and they are vital in maintaining life on Earth. By infecting and killing um, phytoplankton, the uh, marine Viruses are actually a very important part of the ecological system by keeping it in balance. They control the dynamics of, of the ocean populations. So, um, a, a, another interesting fact here. Phytoplankton produce almost half of the world's oxygen and they are the base of the marine food web. They are grazed upon by young marine animals which in, in, in turn fall prey to the fish. The, flank, the plankton is, is also known as the ocean's floating population which consists of tiny organisms including viruses, bacteria, archaea and eukarya. The phytoplankton is a group of organisms that uses solar energy and carbon dioxide to generate their energy by photosynthesis. Hence the word uh, phyto, the plants, get like little tiny microscopic. Yeah. The majority of marine viruses are phages which infect and control the marine bacteria populations. Phages also mistakenly incorporate bits of DNA from one host and carry them to the next, literally viral sex, spreading the genetic material between host bacteria. Um, and, and sometimes these capture genes are actually useful to the new host and they again assist hosts in adapting rapidly to changes in nutrient levels, so allowing them to colonise new, a new niche. Some fakes also carry genes that give a met metabolic boost to prey. For example, many cyanophages that infect cyanobacteria uh, which are the only bacterial members of phytoplankton, carry their own photosynthetic genes. And these genes counteract the effect of other viral genes that are designed to shut down the host genes in order to produce viral rather than host proteins. But inhibiting the photosynthesis too early would obviously cut the cell's lifeline and prevent the completion of a virus life cycle. So the cyanophages supply the key components of the process and then they spread their photosynthesis genes widely. So it's a very interesting kind of dynamic going on here. So, so as I say, so um, I'll just repeat that, because uh, it's quite interesting. So some fakes also carry genes that give a, met a metabolic boost uh, to their prey 
Um, and the example here was that many cyanophages that affect cyanobacteria, the only bacterial members of the phytoplankton, carry their own photosynthetic genes, and then these genes counteract the effect of other viral genes that are designed to shut down the host genes in order for the virus to in order in order for the virus to then produce viral rather than host proteins. But inhibiting photosynthesis too early would cut the cell's lifeline and prevent the completion of a viral life cycle. So, so cyanophages are like key components of the process. So that so that's to say that um, much of the photosynthesis going occur uh, much of the photo much of the um, cyanobacteria's photosynthesis is actually conferred to them by viral genes. So viruses um, actually spread photosynthesis through the ocean, which is really interesting. <clears throat> and cyanobacteria are free living bacteria capable of photosynthesis. Marine viruses kill 20 to 40 percent of marine bacteria every day, and this has an important role in affecting the carbon cycle as well, um, in, in the carbon dynamics, which is quite complicated. We're going to that now, but they have a very important function. Um, okay, so I'm going to move on now to video number two to carry on uh, talking about viruses and the immune system. So, moving on to video number two.